from 2020 to 2022. And she believes that organ donation and transplantation is not well known or talked about or well talked about topic. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Dr. Hasina Mohammed, my co-host. Hi, good evening, and thank you so much, Ms. Hingson, for that um, introduction. I appreciate it. So um, before I start, I would just like to say thank you so much for inviting me to co-host today. Um, and it's my honor to be part of this um, one month event. And I, I've looked at it and it's been very excellent and well laid out. And it is aimed at, it is accomplishing everything that it was aimed at doing. So thank you so much for having me here today to co-host. Uh, so let us, I don't want to delay any more, so we will get right into the introduction of the moderator tonight. And this is a lady that I hold in very high esteem. Our moderator tonight for this meeting is Dr. Elaine Monica Davis. She is a medical practitioner, university lecturer, a diplomat, a motivational speaker, and a founder of Wisdom for Wellness. Since graduating from medical school, at UWE Mona, Jamaica in 1979, Monica has had an avid interest in preventative medicine and wellness. Long before wellness was a buzzword, she started her private general practice in 1984, geared towards keeping her patients in good health and was moved to create GJ Exercise Plus, now called Wisdom for Wellness a consulting entity designed to assist clients to purposefully craft healthy lifestyles and therefore maintain an exciting life blend of health, wellness, well-being, and resilience, and a culture of internal peace. So without any more delay, I welcome Dr. Monica Davis as our moderator for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Mohammed. Um, another one of, of my prized former students and Hasina, it really gives me great pride to be um, on another um, event with you, um, sharing the, the old and the new in age as well as other things. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be the moderator tonight and um, greetings and thanks and congratulations go out to the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association, the team, our um, uh, accompanied host this evening, um, um, Mrs. Karen Hingston, who's done a very good job for the entire month. And I've got to tell you, everybody, that this really, if there ever was an endometriosis month, this is it. Because the team for TTEA has had an event almost every weekend. In fact, I think it will be every weekend for this month, and there's another one next weekend as well. But I digress. This evening, we are privileged to have with us um, three distinguished medical practitioners, um, all specializing in the fields of endometriosis. Um, unfortunately, our first speaker, Dr. Brian Brady, um, is unavoidably um, unavailable for this evening. So I still would like to um, recognize him as one of the leading endometriosis specialists in this country and in the region. So let me just say a few words about him first. And then we will get in um, for Dr. Dulemba to start his presentation. So Dr. Brian Brady has been in clinical practice for over 20 years. And he has a breadth of international experience as a consultant um, at the um, level of consultant in obstetrics and gynecology. Scottish by birth, um, he was um, relocated um, and now he's with the University of the West Indies and he practices at the Port of Spain General Hospital. Um, while overseeing his tenure, he's also responsible for both undergraduate and postgraduate training and has a strong background in clinical research and evidence-based practice within his field. Dr. Brady graduated from Edinburgh University in 1996, some um, 40 years later than both my parents, um, with a first class honors in medical sciences. Thereafter, Brian was awarded Medical Research Council Fellowship. He obtained his MD doctorate in reproductive medicine while he was training in, in the specialty. He was also awarded the prestigious gold medal in the membership of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2005. And he has been recently elected as a fellow. 
there's lots more we could say about Dr. Brian Brady, but the, the, the best we can do tonight is say, Brian, we're sorry you're not here with us, but we know there'll be other occasions. And thank you so much for your dedication, specialization, and commitment to endometriosis in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so let's move on. And when we talk about moving on, this is really, we can decide whether we want to move on by car, by bicycle, by walking, but this gentleman who's going to speak to you now has done it by plane, by helicopter. John Dulemba, prior to earning his college degree, entered the US Army. He flew helicopters. He spent one year in Vietnam and was also a flight instructor. He graduated from Embry-Riddle University, Aeronautical University in Florida in 1973 with a degree in aviation science. So you might add, why is Dr. Dulemba here speaking on spotlight of endometriosis? Well, he attended the University of Pennsylvania um, School of Medicine, now known as the Perelman School of Medicine from 1978 to 1982. Completed his OBGYN training at Western Penn Hospital in Pittsburgh in 1986. Dr. Dulemba has been in private practice in Denton, Texas since 1986. His focus has been pelvic pain, laparoscopy and endometriosis as he has performed over 4,000 standard laparoscopic endometriosis cases. In 2007, Dr. Dulemba began performing robotic surgery and performs all his laparoscopic surgery now utilizing the robot. He has completed well over 2,000 robotic endometriosis cases. Dr. Dulemba has published several papers addressing pelvic pain, laparoscopy, endometriosis, and robotic surgery. And present, and he was presented the Sir Alec Turnbull lecture. He, sorry, he presented the Sir Alec Turnbull lecture at the annual British Society of Gynecolo Gynecologic Surgeons in 2007. Dr. John F. Dulamba only treats endometriosis or pelvic pain patients. That gives you a new meaning to PPP, pelvic pain patients. And he has been, he has had a particular interest in adhesions, one of the many complications that we are aware of that does happen with repeated um, endometrial surgery. Now, you'd wonder where else can we go with this, the description of our first speaker, but there is more. Dr. Dilemba apparently has a, a, what shall I say, a comrade in arms, since he's in army, um, here in Trinidad and Tobago, another colleague um, whose only last name I'm going to give is De Freitas. Um, if, if you are here among us, you know that, um, I'm not divulging any other stories if I didn't even divulge your first name. I understand though that there are a number of stories that both of you could tell. Um, I know Dr. Dulemba, we've not met, but you were hoping to be here at some point in time for Carnival because you usually come down here at Carnival time, but COVID-19 conspired against it. So you're here with us virtually, but I dare say there'll be other times when you can come and resume your story making with your dear friend and colleague, Dr. De Freitas. So. Before we actually get started, let me just um, say quickly that I'm told that there is uh, about 20 minutes for each presenter. Um, we have three presenters and possibly um, because Dr. Brady couldn't join us, you might be able to go a little bit over your 20 minutes. But I have a little bell here, which I'm going to be sounding at about three minutes. <laughs> you have your alarm on your phone already, great. So you won't need to hear my bell. So about three minutes before the end of your presentation, I'll just give a little tinkle so that you remember, and then we can wind up. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John F. Dulemba. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to uh, be speaking to, to everybody here at uh, Trinidad and, and Tobago. Um, I, I, I only have one correction on, on your introduction is that that 4,000 plus cases with, was with standard laparoscopy. I now have well over, well over 2,000 endometriosis cases with the, with the robot. And, and I have a, an addiction to the robot because it actually is almost like flying a helicopter because the robot has hand controls and foot pedals and that's exactly what I had is, is in a helicopter. So I sometimes flash back like I'm a young man in Vietnam, and, and it's, it's kind of a pleasant experience most of the time. So, of course, I'm still attacking an enemy, and that enemy is endometriosis. And also, the one that's oftentimes forgotten, which might even be in some cases worse than endometriosis, it's adhesions. 
I know that what I was taught in medical school about endometriosis and in residency is not what I see today. And it's the same thing with adhesions. What I've learned about adhesions in private practice is almost nothing what I was taught as a, as a, uh, uh, a trainee and also as a medical student. So these are things that I've learned on my own. Yes, there's data published and, and I think there's some good data, some bad data. But, but again, we all have to look at our own experience. And when you had mentioned um, the, other, the other physician about evidence-based medicine, there's three things we have to remember. Always look at the best data. Then you also look at the clinical experience of the physician. And then you look at the needs and the wants of a patient. You, and each, pa each patient is individual. If you don't look at all three, then you don't practice evidence-based medicine. So with that, I'd like to bring my slides up because um, I think some of them are important. Um, let me go right there and share this with everybody. And then um, what I want to do is, is go to the, uh, so slide it down this way a little bit and go to slideshow play from the start. So um, as it says, I'm in Denton, Texas, which is not too far from, from Dallas, about 35 miles. Uh, we had some fun several weeks ago when it was very, very cold, ice and snow and no electricity. So um, it, was, it wasn't endometriosis, wasn't pain, but many of us were suffering. So adhesions and pain. Adhesions can cause an issue with infertility, but I don't address that aspect of it. So the biggest thing that we have to remember is adhesions are normal. That is not an abnormal aspect of our bodies. As it says on the first bullet point, any injury to our body, whether it's outside the abdomen or inside the abdomen, can cause adhesions, scars, fibrosis. And I often intermix those three things because they're all the same. You can get adhesions. We've all seen burn victims, what their skin can look like. That's fibrosis. We have scars when we're cut and adhesions when organs stick to each other. So what can cause endometriosis? I, I, I'm sorry, adhesions, endometriosis. That's what we're here for. Uh, you know, it's an inflammation inside our body and our body is trying to fix it. So this is a consequence and a sequence of events from endometriosis. Infection, if you have a, uh, an infection in your appendix, if you have an infection in your fallopian tubes, ovaries, you can get scar tissue and adhesions and fibrosis. Bleeding, and, and, and I have it further down, when you ovulate, an egg can come out. And when it comes out, what can go with it? Blood. So even a normal process can sometimes cause adhesions. We also have what's called de novo, where we don't even know why there's adhesions and things are stuck to each other. And of course, surgery can cause adhesions. And you oftentimes hear, well, don't have surgery for adhesions because you'll just get more. And I don't disagree with that. But as we go on further in the discussion, we will have um, some options for that. And so can adhesions be seen on imaging? Sometimes, certainly occasionally on an ultrasound or if you're pushing ovaries on a pelvic exam, even an MRI on the tissue planes, sometimes it's, it's sort of um, melded together and you can see it then. But most of the time we cannot see adhesions. So always remember they're normal and trying to prevent a normal process is to me as bad if not worse than endometriosis. Symptoms, of course patients can have a lot of symptoms. Pain is the most common that we see, but it can affect other organs. And it sometimes occurs within a few days, but the average is taking around three to six months and even all the way out to 18 months to present as pain. What we often see, and we, we, we sometimes blame endometriosis, is the symptoms get worse and worse and worse, and it develops into a continuous pain versus the cyclic pain that we may see with with the endometriosis. But the surprising thing is, just like endometriosis, not all adhesions cause pain. I, I, <laughs> I wish none of the adhesions cause pain, but they can cause pain. It's the same thing with endometriosis. You can have endometriosis and maybe not have any pain at all. Here is an interesting aspect. Of the next bullet point right here is hip pain. 
I've noticed on many of my patients, various pains when organs are stuck to each other and hip pain um, when an ovary is adhesed to the pelvic side wall is, is one of the things that I see. So if I've on an exam, uh, like an ultrasound or my pelvic exam, if an ovary is stuck, I'll ask them, do you have hip pain? I go, yeah. Usually a gynecologist isn't asking about hip pain. Um, and that's how I develop that symptom correlation with, with the adhesions because the distance is not very far from where the ovary would be stuck and the hip capsule is located, not a very far distance. It could also be endometriosis affecting it and also it can be endometriosis on the ureter, but in that specific area you're, is what you're going to see sometimes with hip pain. Of course, bowel symptoms, and to me, that's one of the worst aspects because bowel is moving stool. And if you have a, a bowel that's stuck and there's a lot of bacterial bacteria in the large bowel and you have fermentation going on, a lot of times when the bowel after eating, maybe one hour after eating, 45 minutes or you exercise and you notice some bloating, in my opinion, from what I've seen, that's not endobelly because I have a hard time correlating eating and being affected with endometriosis in 45 minutes to an hour. To me, that's adhesions because we have a thing called mass effect. When we eat or drink or exercise, our intestines start to work in a synchronized manner. And it takes about 45 minutes for it to, to synchronize the, the movement, what's called peristalsis, where the bowel squeezes to move things down the, the, the um, 30 feet of intestines. And it stirs up the fermentation and what happens? All of a sudden we have patients bloating because the stool's not moving, but you're, you're, you're moving the, um, the fermentation and a, a release of gas. I just recently had a patient who um, deals a lot with fermentation. And when I was mentioning this, as I started to say, she goes, oh, fermentation, no one. So the thought process is there's nothing published on it, but again, that makes more sense bowel being stuck or trying to move stool through a hairpin turn where bowel, the solid bowel can't get through, but liquid can. So bowel symptoms and the bloating after meals are some of the symptoms that we see along with pain with ovulation if you try to ovulate into a mass of adhesions. So this kind of a busy, busy slide but really all we need to worry about is these first two aspects. The instant you're injured, healing starts. There's red blood cells, there's platelets, blood clots, fibrin, fibrinogen, a whole cascade of events that takes about a week and a half to complete. After that, it's mostly architectural changes where you're setting up scaffolding and, and, and other cells are coming in. But the primary healing is right here, the, the first four days and through day six to seven. Three to seven days is the key. This is what I focus on because this is what I think helps decrease scarring, adhesions, fibrosis from occurring. So as you can see, there's a lot going on during those first, first um, aspects of injury. Uh, I saw a recent video on, online and I should have captured it and I didn't. It was a finger that got cut and they just time, time uh, pictured it all the way through like a week and a half. After a week, it's healed. And so for us to think that, you know, three months, six months down the road, that, that adhesions are, are still forming. No, they're formed. Organs are stuck, but we have to focus on that week and a half. So this is a picture on the left. This is an, an appendix. I took this appendix out along with other aspects. And this picture is where five days later, I went back in what's called a second look and I'll describe that. Five days later, I went back in and you can't even see the stump of the appendix, which is right here. If you look very, very close, you might be able to see uh, a little darkness here where the staples are located. Five days, not five months, not five years, five days. And she had other aspects in the, in the um, uh, uh, ab abdomen also. 
Uh, in fact, she's the, one of the, the next patients right there. Um, you can see where I cut out endometriosis over here on the left and the top left picture uh, over here on the right. And of course, uh, took tissue off the bow. So you can see a, a fairly wide the dissection with the ureters presenting themselves here. And um, so one, or I'm sorry, five days later, you can see omentum, which is attached to the bow, stuck, okay? And then as I pulled it away, that is the second picture. I didn't take these pictures specifically for this lecture. These are just pictures I had and I, and I went back and, and pulled them. So I would have taken a better close up picture of that. But you can see five days. So now what I'm going to show you is a video uh, or actually after these, um, this is a hysterectomy. You can see my stitches here. Um, no bleeding, because I've heard some doctors say, if you don't have blood, then you, then you won't have adhesions. Well, yes, there's some aspects here where the, I cauterize some of the tissue so there wouldn't be bleeding. And of course, over here on the right is five days later. Look at the bow stuck all along there and in even part of the vaginal cuff, the top of the vagina. So you can just see it stuck right there. And then as I pulled it down afterwards, again, five days, not five months, not anything. So this next video is when I used to do it in one week. And I found five days to be better for the second look. So let me show you here. And I click to start it and it says, no adhesions at the end of the case and the ovary suspended. You can see the stitch suspending the ovary. I don't do it anymore. You can see an outline where I excised endometriosis, cut it off the bow, even over on the right. One week later, same patient, look at the bow stuck. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell a delineation between there, but the key is notice, it's not, not actually the bow, it's, it's attached to the bow, the fat, but look at that. It wasn't like that when I finished, it was not like that. And now, and I write on here, so look how easily the tissue separated. What I mean is I don't have to cut it, but you can see a scaffolding start to be developing. And these, if I don't separate it, that ovary is stuck, glued, and you can see the tissue being pulled apart as I do it, and even up here. So I succeeded keeping the ovary from sticking to the sidewall, but bow stuck to the ovary and that stuck up there. And of course, at the very end, once we irrigated um, and looked around, you can see, I was taught that in a week, that uh, in actually 24 hours, repair to the tissue would repair to the in, in a day, 24 hours. I, I don't think that's the case. I know what we're taught is not what I see when I go back in. So with that, let's look at the next slide. And the key is you and the surgeon must have a plan to try and prevent adhesions from forming or reforming. If you don't have a plan, why well, cut them? Well, as soon as you take all the carbon dioxide out, guess what? Everything has restuck potentially. And I found by doing second looks and also what some of the data shows, about 80% of patients get adhesions. Not everybody does. I wish I knew who was going to get adhesions and who wasn't. I just had one last week, no adhesions. And I thought for sure, she was going to have adhesions. She did not. And of course, patients always ask me, do you think I'll get them? I don't know. I, I, I really wish I knew, because then I could say, let's address yours and you don't have to worry. So what are the options? How do you do things besides a second look? Well, first off, you want to be accurate and precise. You want to cut out all the adhesions and you want to cut all the endometriosis or anything that might be affecting the inside of your abdomen, this foreign tissue. So, you know, of course, surgeons that uh, sometimes are accurate and precise, but our endometriosis experts are very accurate, very precise. Heated and humidified carbon dioxide. To me, that's one of the keys. Not so much where you've operated. You have a raw surface. But the non-surgical area, if you hold your eye down, for like, and, and wave air at it or, or do it for about an hour, your eye is going to get inflamed. 
And the same thing with the non-surgical areas. If you're in there for three, four, five hours operating, blowing cold, dry carbon dioxide in there, it might injure and become inflamed the non-surgical areas. So the heat and humidified is like being in Trinidad or Houston, Texas in the summer, where it's like 99 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity, you stay hot and wet. So that's the key. You want those non-surgical areas to stay moist. Excise endometriosis. I use a CO2 laser and I think it's extremely accurate and precise, a little bit less bleeding because it gets the very small vessels. So uh, again, whatever tool you use, that's wonderful. Barriers. You know, the, the, the key to barriers is, you know, there's movies where somebody has put, put their tongue on a pole that was frozen and their tongue can freeze. Or if you pick up ice and you have water in your hand, it can stick. If you put cardboard between your finger or your tongue in that pole, it's not going to stick. And I mentioned cardboard for a reason, because one of the products that's indicated is called Interseed, regenerated cellulose, plant cell wall, cardboard. It's been around for decades. My opinion, it's like throwing super glue in there, even though it's indicated. And there's a lot of doctors out there that don't um, use other indicated products. Somebody that does obstetrics, there's a drug called Ritadrine to prevent preterm labor, doesn't work, but it's indicated. So just having an indication does mean, not mean something works. I use placental tissue when I can. Um, and, and hopefully I'm going to allow my hospital to let me try a different technique where I can uh, leave um, uh, Gore-Tex and then take it out on the second look. And then if there's any adhesions anywhere to use the, the placental barrier. And of course the seventh, second look surgery. Um, some of the studies that were done looked a third time to see how effective pulling the tissue up, uh, apart in three to seven days 70% of those 80% that had adhesions did not grow or regrow, but 30% did. So it's not perfect, but to me, it's one of the best things that we can do. And of course, we see post-op physical therapy and massage. If you can do it within the first week, that's great, but most people are in pain and they can't tolerate having you know, somebody really push on their abdomen to try and separate pick, uh, organs like I showed you in that video. Deep tissue massage after about a week and a half is, in my opinion, a waste of time. And when you get months down the road where you can really tolerate it, it's not coming apart. That tissue has to be cut. And if you can figure out a way to separate it, you might even damage some of the tissue trying to pull it apart. So, um, I have some references here if anybody wants to, to jot them down. Um, as I said, some are good, some are bad. I don't agree with them all. Um, in my data that I've gathered, it's far from published. I, I don't like to publish because I'm, I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> but, but again, um, it's about 70% also on my patients where, and I, and I go basically, basically on the long-term pain relief versus the um, um, uh, looking back in to see it. So um, with that, we come back to me and, and um, did I forget how to quit sharing that? Um, there we go. No. Ah, stop share. There's a little click right there. So, um, that was my 20 minutes. Actually, I think I was pretty good. And, and any questions, I, I think we're going to have a panel, if I'm not mistaken, you can ask them then. Well, you're the, you're the first place winner, one out of one so far. You were exactly on the <laughs> nose. Um, you started at 1824 and you finished at 1844. So tremendous. Thank but you. I, have a little, I have a little question. I'm noticing the jacket. I wish I could see a little more on the jacket. This is... This has become a, a tradition for me now um, for endometriosis month. Tried, I try to do it any, any functions. Um, I'm a huge, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is a, the American football team there uh, called the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I also have pants to match this. And my tuxedo has the bow tie, black and yellow studs, um, cufflinks and my cummerbund or my vest. And 
and over my shoulder, uh, there it is, is the same thing. Um, yeah, I'm a little addicted. And even my yellow shirt for the month is also a Pittsburgh Steeler. So it's perfect that the yellow is my team just for the endometriosis awareness month. That's, that's, that's what you call providence and serendipity. Amazing. But I love it. And perhaps one of these days when we have a gala version of our um, TTA endometriosis, endometriosis month, you'll be able to come down and wear your tuxedo and uh, your Steelers bow tie. Yeah. I'd love to have a picture with you in that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that edifying talk. And I must tell you, I didn't even know that that hips could get stuck. I mean, you know, ovaries could get hips. stuck in hips. No, ovaries could get stuck in hips. I, I found that very interesting. Well, it's a little distance away, but yeah. they, they, it feels like they're hip and they the image yeah. and look and it's all fine. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And we'll hear from you again when we have the um, question on superior. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. DeLambo. Well, I think we had a great start there. And um, there's no, as, as McFadden and Whitehead said, ain't no stopping us now. Our second speaker is Dr. Jeff Arrington. And for those of you who may, may not know, he's actually a colleague of um, an illustrious speaker that we had on last weekend, Dr. Kenny Sinervo. So um, we know Dr. Sinervo was, was, was excellent in his presentation and we expect no less from Dr. Jeff Arrington. MD, FACOG, ACGE. He's a renowned expert in minimally invasive gynecological surgery, which I like to call MIGS, um, sound like I know what I'm talking about, and advanced excision of endometriosis. Since the days of his fellowship with internationally renowned surgeon and pioneer, Dr. C.Y. Liu, he has continued to challenge his knowledge and surgical skills to help patients with hopeless cases of this disease. And we know we do have a, quite a number of persons who admitted last weekend that they felt absolutely hopeless. So this is beautifully timed, Dr. Arrington. During medical school, he found an affinity for, um, for um, MIGS and was drawn to obstetrics and gynecology after completing his rotations. Still, surgery was his favorite part. And during residency, he found opportunities to learn from advanced laparoscopic surgeons and push for advancement of laparoscopic procedures. He was given an honorary membership to the AAGL for his excellence in minimally invasive surgery during his third year of residency. He remains active and engaged and contributing to many professional societies, including the AAGL, wherein he serves as an annual presenter and faculty member on many aspects of surgery. Before joining Dr. Sinerva at the Center for Endometriosis Care, Dr. Arrington was instrumental in, in advancing minimally invasive surgical care across the state of Utah and performed many firsts for Utah and the Intermountain region. He was the highest volume robotic surgeon in the state before moving to the Center for Endometriosis Care. And the evolution of his practice to focus on advanced excision of endometriosis really was driven by patient need. His dedicated insights and compassion made him a leader in endometriosis. He understands the frustration, the hopelessness, and the fear that so many patients have experienced as a result of this disease. And he is prepared to help wherever he can. He advocates for patients every day, both in and out of his OR. And Dr. Arrington is known for his compassion and support and all those of all of those struggling with this condition. He is much beloved by his patients and those around the global endometriosis community. He has developed a skill and comfort level to help the hopeless. And he's a firm believer that the best treatment for endometriosis is full excision of all disease. And we've heard that over and repeatedly through this series of endometriosis um, talks this month. He also has a solid understanding of the purpose and limitations of any hormone therapies that many OBGYN generalists use for endometriosis treatment. Through his interest in this disease, Dr. Arrington has truly found his happy place as it, terms, as it regards work. He enjoys the challenge of difficult surgery, providing even slight hope to patients who have suffered with a difficult disease for far too long, and the challenge of early management to prevent destructive progression. Coming from a politically involved family, he also enjoys working closely with patient advocates to raise awareness of inappropriate management protocols for endometriosis. Most importantly, even with the joy and success that he has found with his gynecologic surgery, 
and advancing endometriosis care. His greatest success is, and always will be, his beautiful family. With those words, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Jeff Arrington, to this space this evening. I hope this is another happy space for you. Oh, and, definitely. Great. And I know you're going to be talking this evening on endometriosis and adolescence. And I think that is very pertinent because we are actually trying to push that the earlier we diagnose and recognize endometriosis, and this is often the case that it's in adolescence where they get dismissed for having bad period pain and that's it. So I think this is extremely timely. I'm very happy on behalf of the association to invite you to present your little talk. Now, I didn't have to use my little bell just now because um, Dr. Dulembo was actually on spot. So let's see how you fare. Thank you very much. And we are pleased to listen to you now. Sounds good. What an incredible honor for me uh, to be part of this. Um, Dr. Dulembo, we'll talk a little bit later, but I've got a son-in-law, you will know this, is, is applying to be a warrant officer in the army. And hopefully this is going to work. There, can, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Beautiful so slide. Let's start. So pediatric endometriosis, uh, adolescent endometriosis. You know, as we, as we go back in the history of endometriosis as a disease, so I'm going to start my timer too. Endometriosis is a disease, and we look at all the, the talk that we have had from patient advocates, from the needs of patients, and even from recognized endometriosis providers and organizations. One of the main lamentations that we have is the delay in diagnosis, of, or delay to diagnosis of this disease. I don't think there is anybody in the endometriosis community on provider from providers or patients who does not think that this is an issue. And it becomes an incredibly important issue when we start talking about pediatric or adolescent endometriosis, the earliest of our patients. I have no disclosures to give. Uh, to start, I would just like to provide some basic statistics and symptoms. These are things that we commonly find in our younger patients and sometimes even patients before they have started having their periods. Dysmenorrhea or painful period is the most common menstrual symptom in adolescents. And this happens in 50 to 90% of these patients. And unless, unless we know an obvious source, so if there's, if there's an abnormality in the outflow, or if there's, there are other things going on that we know are causing the pain, this pain is described as primary dysmenorrhea or primary painful periods, primary meaning we don't know the cause of it. And over uh, and of primary dysmenorrhea, endometriosis is the leading cause of that symptom. Over half of these pediatric patients have gastrointestinal or urinary symptoms. And again, these often will present before the period actually comes. So often these younger patients uh, have seen uh, gastroenterologists, GI specialists, bladder specialists, running through a number of different specialists trying to find out why they hurt without endometriosis ever coming into the picture. And they can present with intestinal pain, painful bowel movements, nausea, vomiting, urinary frequency, and dysuria or painful urination. Uh, it's important to understand how this impacts our, our teen patients. Nearly 12% of these patients with endometriosis miss work or school or school or work due to period related pain. I'll go to, I will talk with patients who are now in their 20s and 30s and I always go back to their teen history to figure out how this affected them and what their risk is of having disease. And it's remarkable how many of these 20 and 30 and 40 year olds go back to their high school days and talk about curling up in their bed or, or staying home because their periods hurt too bad that it really does impact their ability to study. It also affects what they're able to do outside of school, their sports, their, their music, all these other school related things that they like to do. It, it affects their ability to work as a team and it affects their social rela relationships. This critical time when these, lack of a better way to put it, where these kids are trying to learn who they are and how they interact with other people they have this disease comes in and really alters and changes how they have to behave. It also affects their mental health. 
uh, at a time where so many are struggling at that age, adding this complexity into it just really, really causes problems with anxiety and depression. And these are unfortunately super common in our adolescent patients. <clears throat> when we look at treatment goals and considerations, understanding that we are talking about teenage patients, but really these treatment goals apply to any patient with endometriosis. First, not first, but one is we want to control and prevent pain. We want to help them with daily function. We want to be able to get them to a point where they can participate in life. We want to prevent progression of the disease and we want to preserve their fertility. So all four of these are create what I call the endometriosis patient. And it is very common for providers, OBGYN providers to focus only on this first one. As we go through this, we will talk about some treatment options that only focus on this aspect of a patient, the control and prevention of pain. We cannot forget those other three. The American College of, Gyne of Obstetrician Gynecologists in their, in their adolescent educational paper states that the goals of therapy include symptom relief, suppression of disease progression, and protection of future fertility. These are the three stated goals that we should look and evaluate any therapy. They, get, they then go on to discuss a number of different options. They go on to discuss a lot of hormones and medications and other, present, other things. But then if we flip and look at just their general uh, practice bulletin regarding the management of endometriosis, there is a key phrase hidden inside the middle of that bulletin that states, there are no data to support the use of medical treatment to prevent progression of the disease. So one of the major focuses that we as gynecologists put on the treatment of endometriosis has no proven benefit to prevent the progression of this disease. And that is important to understand. Um, when one thing that has bothered me and, and those who have followed me on social media today really understand that this has really rocked my boat today and has been a problem and a concern for me for a few months to uh, years or so now, that there is a new shift or a new paradigm in some of the higher ups or academic circles of endometriosis regarding diagnosis of endometriosis and treatment. And the big push is to say that we can now make the diagnosis of endometriosis based on clinical symptoms, where we look back at that patient history and say painful periods, painful bowel movements, all these symptoms, you probably do have endometriosis. Now we're going to call it endometriosis. But what does that benefit the patient? Um, they, they state that now we have de suddenly decreased the delay in diagnosis from eight to 10 years because we finally just decided that all these symptoms the patient is having, we now call it endometriosis and the delay of diagnosis is solved. The problem comes though, is what benefit do we get by ending the delay of diagnosis when we don't end the delay to appropriate treatment? The benefit of the early diagnosis should be early intervention and early treatment. And the recommendation of initial hormone palliation after making a presumptive clinical diagnosis can be appropriate in the adolescent patient, but there are some things that we need to understand and some things that the patients need to understand before they can make an informed decision. Really the, this current approach to, hey, let's just call it endometriosis and go back and continue to use the same hormones that we've been using for the last 30 years, this really gets nowhere. It's zero progress other than changing the outfit that we're wrapping this disease in. This is a common patient experience. So patient presents with suspicion of endometriosis. We start an initial trial of birth control pills. And I do think this is very appropriate in an adolescent patient. And we'll go through some of the important considerations. If their pain is controlled, so if it is successful, we can continue that medicine with an understanding. But if that patient does not have symptom control, we then often see that they change the birth control pill or their provider may go on and say, hey, we don't know what's causing this. Let's go look surgically and see what's going on. And then if they go the surgical evaluation, ideally that patient is now on a path of potential treatment of the disease. 
They change the birth control pill, they give it a few months. If that doesn't work, they change the birth control again, or they consider a different hormone like a progesterone only pill. And then if that doesn't work, uh, sometimes they will go over to surgery, but often they throw in a GNRH modifier that this is considered the ultimate top tier, the third tier, the highest level of treatment that we can get medically. And this is a common pathway that we see in these patients. Often these patients are told they are too young for surgery, that they just need to continue to stick with what they're taking and continue to struggle through life. And some of my patients even, even tell me that they've been told to get pre just get pregnant at the age of 17, 18, 19, that that will solve all of their problems. We need to remember that kids are people too. Endometriosis sees adolescents as patients, as people. It doesn't, it doesn't delineate between an adolescent patient and an adult patient. It attacks and it behaves the same way. When we look and consider hormones in treatment of any endometriosis patient, particularly the adolescent patient, we need to understand that the only proven role of hormones in endometriosis is palliation. It is symptom control. There is no evidence that it prevents the progression of disease. There is no evidence that it makes the disease go away. There's no evidence that it makes disease after we do a partial surgery, that if we put the patient on Lupron, that it will kill off the rest. There is no evidence to support those statements at all. And this discussion should be the, a part of our informed consent with an adolescent patient to say, look, we can try this hormone with the idea that we want you to be comfortable. We want you to be able to participate in life. But if it doesn't work, I need you to understand that you need to tell me so that we can look at other ways to try to help you. But also if this does work and your pain is controlled and you are able to continue with life, you need to understand that you potentially have a disease inside of you that can continue to progress even though your pain is controlled. And that if not put in check or not evaluated in some fashion, could destroy your hopes and dreams of family or destructive disease that in invades other organs. They need to be aware of some of the potential consequences of hormone palliation. When we look at how well do these hormones look, work, we often see in, in structured um, prescribing that we start out with birth control pills as a level one. Sometimes if that doesn't work, we go to an IUD as a level two. And then the third tier, we often see the Lupron of the GNRH or modulators, elagolix. Um, there are studies on the left side of the screen. These three medicines, both birth control pills and the levonorgestrel IUD, have both been tested head to head against Lupron. In those studies, Lupron did not for, perform any better than an IUD or a simple birth control pill at controlling endometriosis symptoms. And Elagolix or Lissa is new. There have not been very many studies and really no head-to-head -head studies focused purely on pain. But there was a published study comparing Elagolix to Depomedroxyprogesterone, Depoprovera, looking, the main purpose of the study was looking at bone density, but a secondary outcome was pain and symptom relief. And in that study, Elagolix did not perform any better at pain relief than a Depoprovera shot. So is hormone shopping justified? That whole tier where birth control, then birth control, then birth control, then progesterone pill, then IUD, and then finally to, to Lupron or Elagolix. Is that justified? I don't think that we can say that is justified based off the evidence that we have. When we consider surgical management, again, the stated goals of endometriosis treatment are symptom relief, prevention of progression, protection of fertility. To date, surgery is the only option we know of that can accomplish all three of these. Surgery is not perfect. There are some patients who continue with pain. There are some patients who have residual or new endometriosis. There are some patients who develop adhesions like Dr. DeLemba has just mentioned that can affect fertility. But this is the only treatment option that has any possibility of managing all three of those goals. As surgeons, we, must be, we need to be honest about the goals of treatment and the possible impacts of surgery. Adhesions need to be discussed. Missed disease needs to be discussed. We also need to prepare the patient and evaluate for continued pain generators. Often, often patients are told that you can't have surgery because it's just too risky, or before you have kids, because it's too risky. 
that the risk of adhesion formation is too high and the more surgeries you have, the more risk of adhesions. Um, I like to pull up this slide just as, a, as an example that it, we need to also consider adhesions while we ignore the disease or while we choose to palliate the disease. The picture on the left is a published picture in a study in a pediatric journal uh, where they commented about the significant uh, adhesions from surgery of the right ovary to the pelvic sidewall. These are the significant adhesions mentioned in their study. The case to the right is a 15 year old patient who had been treated with Lupron and other hormones for five years. This is her first surgery. And this is the degree of adhesions that she had just because of the disease while she was on hormone palliation. We have a fallopian tube here. The ovary is completely stuck to the back of the uterus. The right ovary was back, uh, stuck. She had bowel endometriosis in the rectovaginal space. So adhesions do not just form from surgery that we need to consider those as we consider treatment options. Uh, it's also important when we go in to do surgery for an adolescent patient that we need to understand that some of this disease can be very early in their presentation and we need to know how, evalu how to evaluate and how to look for it. This is a quick video showing near contact laparoscopy. Right here is just a single subtle depression in the, and a difference in the peritoneum, one or two millimeters wide. Just recognize that that's different than everything else around it. And that way we can remove that tissue confirmed endometriosis. Here's another one, almost at the very end of a surgery, just doing a final look. And lo and behold, we find these spider web lesions in the cul-de-sac, again, very subtle. Uh, this is another, I believe, video showing how another way I evaluate, just looking side to side, comparing normal and abnormal, grabbing tissue, pulling tissue, trying to find something that might be hidden and evaluating the tissue with movement, with visualization and appearance. Same thing here, some spots on the right side. Well, just these single white lesions that look different than everything else around them. And then down in the cul-de-sac, a little depression pocket, a lesion up here toward the top. But anything that looks different than the surrounding tissue has the potential of being endometriosis. Options for management in adolescent endometriosis. Some option, the same options are used with teenage patients as I use with any patient. I present all of these to every patient that comes to my office. The first one, unless there is an urgent or emergent indication, the first option we talk about is observation. Look, we either know you have endo or you might have endo. One choice is just to know that and just to watch the symptoms and see how you do. The second is medical treatment or hormone palliation. Let's try to control the symptoms, understanding that there is a possibility of disease progression that may make it harder to treat in the future. The third is surgical management. A full informed consent requires discussion of all these options, regardless of a provider's preference or a provider's ability. A patient needs to learn about all aspects of these three options in order to make an informed, an informed decision that could impact the rest of her life. Again, teenage patients, adult patients, the management of this disease to me is no different between the two. And the only hope I think that we have of ending the delay of diagnosis and possibly even preventing these advanced stage, what I call destructive endometriosis cases is to maybe be a little more liberal with the ability to look in surgically, to find an early di an actual diagnosis, know the state of disease, until we can figure that out with non-surgical ways, surgery, early surgery has a definite role in the management of these patients. Uh, let me jump out here. And this is something that has been very hot on my mind today, very hot on my mind for a long time. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, uh, but there are many, 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 many uh, who are working hard uh, to try to break the norms. To try to, to try to bring common sense to the approach of endometriosis. And uh, I'm so grateful for the chance and opportunity to be here with you today. This is an incredible honor for me. Uh, what a great, great understanding group the TTEA is. 
uh, and just a fabulous, fabulous program. And uh, I'd like to end that presentation and turn the time over. And I didn't hear the bell. No, you didn't, because there was no need to ring the bell. Um, you finished spot on 1910 as well. Fantastic. I think we're on a roll here tonight. Your presentation was really um, very, very interesting, um, as all have been. But I think I'm, I'm seeing that, the, the, that you probably should add to your list of, of, of qualifications um, lawyer in training, because you sound um, in your advocacy, it is very clear that you're really passionate about doing right by these patients. And that is to be admired by all. Um, what I particularly liked and, and picked from your, um, from your talk uh, is that the distinction, the clear distinction you made between treatment of endometriosis with hormones, with hormones mm -hmm. as opposed to treatment of endometriosis related pain. I think that's a very clear distinction, very pertinent, very germane. And I think that um, it is critical when you say that, that you must have um, full um, uh, consent and, and, and therefore in order to do that, you must ventilate these things so that people are perfectly in sync with the fact that it may just treat the pain. And if that's what you want, just to treat the pain and get on with life, that's fine, but it's not gonna get rid of your disease. So right. thank you so much for bringing out that point so clearly as, as you did with the others. And I think we have two out of two so far. Um, so that's amazing. Thank you very much. I will speak thank with you, you again in the, in the question and answer period. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to have our third speaker now, um, who I'm proud to say, and I've said before, it's, it's so wonderful interacting with my former students as colleagues. Um, Hasina is co-hosting and now Janelle is coming to speak as a MIG surgeon um, in, her own, um, in her own space. Um, I'm very happy to introduce um, Dr. Janelle Jackman, who was born in the culturally diverse Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. She's an accomplished physician in obstetrics and gynecology and has a passion for reproductive endocrinology and infertility, as well as endometriosis, which you shall soon see. You see, she's getting excited already. She's licking her lips. <laughs> Dr. Jackman obtained her Bachelor of Medical Sciences degree as well as her medical degree from our alma mater, the University of the West Indies. Um, and actually she did it here in St. Augustine. Um, she went on to specialize as an obstetrician gynecologist at the Brooklyn Hospital Center, graduating at the top of her class, again, with research on reproductive health. Um, she then went on to what she's currently involved in and is being a fellow. She's completing a fellowship in um, MINX, um, Minimally Invasive Reproductive Gynecological Surgery with a focus on endometriosis. She's an excellently skilled surgeon with extensive experience in performing both laparoscopic and robotic surgery. I like this robotic thing, you know, everybody's into it now, right? This sounds really interesting. She has an intrinsic desire to help families with infertility, as well as patients suffering from the pain of endometriosis, which we have clearly heard just now is palliated with hormones and not treated. And while she does this, she stretches the boundaries of modern medicine. Dr. Jackman is an active researcher and the recipient of many awards. She has published manuscripts in high quality medical journals, She's passionate about education and loves sharing knowledge. Yeah, she's been on every forum so far for the month with endometriosis, and she's taking a break from her fellowship. Um, she's teaching, at the moment, she's teaching resident physicians and medical students alike, as well as she prepares papers for um, board questions in OBGYN. She's striving daily to provide a comfortable and caring environment in order to ensure that her patients are fully able to get their reproductive needs and goals addressed. Now today, Dr. Jackman is going to be speaking to us on the surgical management of endometriosis for patients with infertility. Now we know not all endo patients are infertile and not all infertile patients have endometriosis. So Janelle, the same applies with the bell. I have not had to use it so far. So as my former student, please don't let me have to use it on you. Well, I think that's a little extra time for me. Good, good, good. 
So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Janelle Jackman. Hello, good night, everyone. I'm going to just pull up my presentation. Sorry about this. Whoops. There we go. Hi, good night. Yes, I'm Dr. Janelle Jackman, and tonight I'm doing the surgical management of endometriosis for patients with infertility. So just a brief overview of endometriosis, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Endometriosis occurs when tissue similar to the lining of the uterus is present outside of the uterus. It is one of the most common gynecologic disorders, but I um, like to consider it a whole body disorder, not just focused to gynecology, affecting approximately 10% of all reproductive age women, which I think is rather underestimated, and in about 35 to 50% of patients with pelvic pain and infertility. It's chronic, it's progressive, estrogen-dependent disease, and can cause pain, infertility, and organ dysfunction. Some people are actually also asymptomatic, um, and patients require thorough evaluation with attention to individual treatment goals, as was mentioned before, and many patients can be managed medically, and that word managed, so it's not that it's cured when you use um, medical management, as was stated before. However, when medical management fails to obtain the treatment goals or when fertility is desired, surgical treatment may be recommended. And I'm here to focus on surgical treatment, but I'm going to give an overview on everything. So there are several explanations as to the causes of endometriosis. I'm not going to go into the depth of all of them. And uh, my slides are available at TTEA if you want to read more into this. But I'm just going to highlight the retrograde menstruation as this is commonly cited reason for endometriosis. Um, it's thought that the, when the menstrual cycle goes the reverse way, so normally, you know, it goes through the cervix into the vagina and you bleed, but sometimes retrograde menstruation occurs, which means that the blood goes now into the tubes, into the pelvis and the abdomen. We know that this is not a full um, encompassing theory as the possible cause of endometriosis and all these causes listed play some part because there are patients without uterus, um, without a uterus, like in um, uterine uh, anomalies that will still have endometriosis and a few case reports with men with endometriosis. So these are some common cited theories. They're not all 100% perfect so to explain the real reason for endometriosis. Common signs and symptoms of endometriosis. We know a sharp, deep pain during ovulation, ovulatory pain. We have dysmenorrhea, which is uh, severe, painful menstrual cycles, pain with sexual intercourse, pain with bowel movements and urination. Patients could get fatigue, heavy bleeding, infertility, which we're gonna focus on today. And then you have some um, non-distinct symptoms like indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, no nausea. You can even have sciatica. These symptoms tend to heighten during their menstrual cycle, but it could be somewhat chronic. And was mentioned before, um, sometimes some of these pains can be linked to the adhesion formation from endometriosis or the endometriosis itself. So in, to diagnose endometriosis, we have uh, some main category headlines that I like to go through. You can do talk about the history. So if you have a clinical suspicion um, based on the patient's history, it can be suspected in patients who report dysmenorrhea, which is your painful periods, painful sexual intercourse, chronic pain, dyskesia, anything that especially heightens with a menstrual cycle might lead to suspicion of endometriosis. So that's the hist uh, history aspect of it. You can also do a physical exam. It can be helpful to diagnose endometriosis, especially if it's performed during the menstrual cycle, where the lesions may be more inflamed, tender, and palpable. So you may palpate nodules on the uterosacral ligaments um, in particular, the rectovaginal septum, and that might give you an indication of endometriosis. Imaging depends on the experience, especially when you come to ultrasound. It, it depends on the experience of the sonographer, but it's not the most useful um, 
modality always. It uh, may not show obviously the endometriosis, but it may be more be helpful in showing adenomyosis, which is endometriosis. Think of it like endometriosis in the uterine wall, the muscle of the uterus, or an endometrioma or trophocyst, which is endometriosis in the ovary. And our gold standard is still laparoscopic surgery. Um, that's still the gold standard today where endometriosis is actually diagnosed via laparoscopy. And I wouldn't do lap suggest laparoscopy just to diagnose endometriosis. So obviously you're looking for somebody who would diagnose and treat the endometriosis at the same time. This is just pictorial. So when you talk about infertility, it's defined as your inability to get pregnant despite having frequent unprotected sex for at least a year for most couples. That diagnosis and the, um, what time frame you'll use to work up a patient with infertility will change depending on if the patients have any pre-existing conditions, for example, endometriosis, as well as if the, um, depending on the age of the woman as well, you may not wait a full year before you start to intervene. You may, after 35, you may wait six months. After 40 years old, you may intervene as soon as a woman wants to get pregnant. But this is a general diagnosis. Um, at least a year of trying, and it may result from an issue of either the female patient or the partner or a combination of factors that may prevent pregnancy. Uh, endometriosis is one cause of infertility, but obviously we know that there are many different causes of infertility. However, it's present in as high as 50% of infertile women compared to 5% of fertile women. So it's a high, it's a definitely up there in the causes of infertility. Pregnancy rates in women with endometriosis tend to be lower than normal in both natural cycles as well as assisted re reproduction. So that's something to consider that endometriosis does play a big part in fertility in women. So some of the common reasons why endometriosis have a part in infertility is that it um, can distort the pelvic anatomy due to adhesions on scar tissue. It can decrease fertilization secondary to the effect of endometriosis on lowering egg quality. It decreases the, the embryo quality as well, and it may decrease um, sperm quality and implantation. Uh, pelvic pain may limit uh, sexual intercourse with patients for endometriosis. If it's really severe, a woman may not want to have sex in the first place. It may cause hormonal and ovulatory dysfunction, as well as some patients have recurrent pregnancy losses. So these are some of the reasons why endometriosis affects fertility. When we talk about treatments, as was mentioned before as well, um, there, I generalize this into four categories, expectant management, alternative therapy, um, which I um, tend to add to the other forms of treatment, medication or hormonal treatment and minimally, minimally invasive surgery. So patients can incorporate also lifestyle modifications in all aspects of treatment. For example, exercising and diet modifications may help as well as not smoking. Expectant management or watchful waiting, as we know, is an approach to medical problem, which we basically allow time to pass before medical intervention or therapy is used if the patient desires. And during that time, you may want to repeat testing, you may want to examine the patient and check up on how their symptoms progress. Um, but this is obviously not the most useful when we're talking infertility. Alternative therapies, some patients do offer for non-medical treatments like yoga, acupuncture, meditation, mindfulness. And I do think that all of these have good aspects to contribute towards particularly pain management. It may help you cope with the pain. It's not doing anything to get rid or suppress the endometriosis itself, but it may help the individual cope with the pain so that they're good um, adjuncts to, to, to treatment, but it may not be what you want solely, especially if fertility is your goal. Um, but a lot of patients do use this in addition to the treatment recommended. Medical therapy, as was mentioned, um, so dependence of endometriosis is based on the um, woman's menstrual cycle. It depends more or less on the estrogen in particular um, to flourish. So medications used particularly for endometriosis so it tends to um, suppress ovulation, which will decrease the estrogen released by the ovary. And in doing this, it um, particularly may help with pain syndromes. In some cases with um, patients, Sometimes these hormonal therapies are tried um, in some occasions for a couple of months before fertility treatment, but um, they may not be your best option, especially if fertility is desired sooner or if fertility was being tried for a very long time. 
as we know, with women, our fertility is on a time base. So uh, when we're treating someone who's experiencing infertility, you want to do the most effective option as sooner than later. But you have to bear in mind, obviously, that fertility treatment and fertility options have a cost to it. Too. So IVF um, is also considered um, as a part of fertility treatment, but today the presentation is focused on surgery, so I will <laughs> go on to that. One point that I want to know, note is that um, there is no association with long-term use of oral contraceptive pills and decreased fertility in the future. This is a commonly asked question with patients, so just to reassure them that even though it may take a while for their ovulation to resume, um, they don't have any long-term uh, fertility deficits because of being on birth control pills. So with surgical intervention, surgical care can be broadly classified as conservative when the reproductive potential is retained. And obviously this is what we're looking at when we're talking about fertility treatment for infertile patients. Uh, it's defined as semi-conservative when reproductive ability is eliminated, but you retain the ovaries. And then you can say radical treatment when the uterus and ovaries are removed. Obviously, we would not be considering radical treatment in our patients who are desiring fertility. We would be looking at conservative treatment. So age, desire for future childbearing, and deterioration of quality of life are some of the main considerations that you um, take into consideration when you're deciding what surgery to perform. When a patient is young or desiring um, future childbearing potentials, then you want to go more conservative, obviously preserving the uterus and ovary. Surgical efforts are aimed at removal of the endometrial implants and correction of an anatomic distortions. It can be ablating using either laser energy, um, carbon dioxide, or electrosurgical techniques. Um, resection of the implants and adjacent peritoneum is considered the treatment of choice. So excision is better than ablation. Um, and the exact mode of surgery depends on the surgeon's expertise, experience, and well as the availability of proper in instrumentation. So even though it was highlighted that you know there is um, conventional laparoscopic surgery versus robotic surgery, uh, there's no actual data supporting that robotic surgery is better at um, providing pain relief, treatment of endometriosis, or infertility needs. The outcome of both conventional laparoscopic surgery as well as robotic laparoscopic surgery, the outcome, the final objectives are the same. However, they differ in terms of the ease. It's much easier to use a robot than it is to do conventional laparoscopic surgery. Um, but ideally, someone who is um, well-trained in robotic surgery should firstly be ex excellently trained in conventional. So laparoscopic surgery, uh, also known as minimally invasive surgery, and most of our patients will notice as keyhole surgery, the benefits of surgery therapy, surgical therapy for infertility associated with endometriosis have been well documented. Um, however, with the advent of assisted reproductive technologies like IVF, IUI, um, and other interventions, the number of patients undergoing laparoscopic evaluation as part of the initial workup has decreased. Um, so recently, you know, we have a tendency to bypass diagnostic laparoscopy after normal HSG. However, we have seen an increase in pregnancy rates with surgery in patients with endometriosis, and I am going to show you a study showing that. So this was a study done um, by Dr. Najat, and that's who I'm training um, with minimally invasive surgery with, as well as some of the doctors at Stanford University IVF clinic. And they wanted to see um, the basically in experience, in, sorry, they wanted to see in patients with previous IVF failures, um, whether or not they would conceive with laparoscopic intervention or continued IVF. So they had a group of patients that had previously failed IVF. So that was their inclusion criteria. And the intervention was laparoscopic evaluation and treatment of endometriosis by the same surgeon. That surgeon was Dr. Najat. And at the time of the study, he was blinded to um, the patient. So he wasn't aware that the patients were coming from Stanford and deficit like under this particular investigation. So he evaluated the patients and determined if he felt like a diagnosis of endometriosis was probable and did surgery on the patients he thought 
had endometriosis. And then there were a group of patients um, that remained continuing to do IVF treatment at Stanford. And what was so seen was that of the 29 patients with prior IVF failure and who had undergone laparoscopic surgery, 22 of them conceived after laparoscopic treatment of endometriosis. 15 of them um, conceived with non-IVF pregnancies, so on their own, and then seven um, conceived with IVF pregnancies. So it was concluded that in the absence of tubal occlusion or in the absence of severe male infertility, that laparoscopy may still be considered the treatment of endometriosis even after multiple IVF failures. Hmm? So um, basically these are general sets of laparoscopic surgery. You have four, three to four port sites. You don't have to have, or you could have more, but generally three to four. The umbilicus is usually side for the camera and then you have left and right um, lower quadrant. And sometimes we use a middle port. And in the practice with Dr. Najab, we do use this setup with four. Some people would eliminate this middle port. And so with conservative surgery, the aim is to destroy visible endometriotic implants, lies peritubal and periovarian adhesions, and that are a source of pain and that may interfere with ovum transport. The laparoscopic approach is a method of choice for treatment of endometriosis conservatively. Ablation could be performed, but as I said, that generally we see um, better excellent results. And statistically, you do see studies on this, that excision of endometriosis is better than just ablating the endometriosis. In terms of endometriomas, when you have the cyst in the endometriosis in the ovary, this could be treated by drainage which is not recommended. So, I mean, I should have just eliminated that, but I just wanted to highlight this only because I know that a lot of people still do drainage, it's not recommended. Or cystectomy, which is the preferred. So cystectomy and removal of the actual cyst wall is the um, preferred way to treat an endometrioma. So it's yields better pain relief as well as better pregnancy rates than if you drain it. Um, in some cases, depending on how extensive the cyst is, as well as depending on the experience of the surgeon, you may recommend embryo gamete freezing prior to surgical inter intervention, if possible, since surgical treatment can reduce ovarian reserve. The problem with drainage and irrigation of the endometrioma is that the blood can continue to leak into the peritoneal cavity, causing extensive inflammation and adhesion and resulting in a decreased future fertility. So therefore we really wanna get the cyst out. And um, it's extremely difficult sometimes um, to thoroughly irrigate endometriomas if you try to just drain it. So that's why you wanna actually remove the actual cyst wall. Um, and learning this technique is something that we strive um, for people to do, especially if minimally invasive surgeons should know how to do this. It is much easier to obviously remove the ovary, but in someone who's wanting fertility treatment, or even in a woman who's not wanting fertility treatment and is young, you want to be on the more conservative side. Um, and I've we've had lots of patients who come to us where they had an oophorectomy removal of the entire ovary because it was just a much simpler procedure, which is why we caution um, patients to really extensively research who they're going by for treatment to ensure that they will get you know, the right treatment. So surgical staging is something that comes on very often with patients in terms of endometriosis. This is the ASRM surgical staging. Um, it's classified basically into minimal, mild, moderate, and severe based on the location, the extent, and the depth of the endometriosis implants, as well as the severity of scar tissue and the presence of size of endometrial implants in the ovary. This is more a descriptive staging. It is not like how cancer staging can tell you a progression. So stage four in cancers are worse and more progressive and more advanced than a stage one in um, a cancer diagnosis, but in endometriosis, someone can, you know, be a stage four on initial presentation. They can be one after having a stage one after having endometriosis for many years. So the staging does not correlate as what you would expect for cancer. So oftentimes patients, and actually some doctors as well, believe that a patient with stage four endometriosis is far more severe, meaning that they will not get pregnant or that their pain will be much worse than someone with stage one. And it's not an actual one-to-one -one ratio with endometriosis. Someone can have stage one endometriosis and has the worst pain in the world and someone with stage four endometriosis can be very comfortable and none the wiser that they have stage four endometriosis. 
So it doesn't correlate. Location is a big factor to play of um, the symptoms of endometriosis, whether they're going to have severe pain or fertility problems. And the way Dr. Najat often describes it is that if you have a grain of sand in your eye, it's going to be much more uncomfortable than a pocket full of sand. So that's like a handful of sand. So it's not about the amount, it's really the location, the eye versus, you know, in your pocket. Something similar is what I used to describe endometriosis. We have had patients who have um, stage four and has minimal symptoms versus stage one and severe. So the, I, I sort of mentioned this before, the escalating severity of these stages might give the impression that endometriosis, like cancer, first starts off in one part and then it spreads to more distant organs and gets more complicated, but it does not occur like this. As you can have um, stage four severity from the beginning, so it's more a way to serve to communicate laparoscopic findings, but it does not correlate with the severity of infertility or the pain of the patients. Um, so patients like to know their staging um, and they talk often about their staging, but it may not be the most useful to correlate um, you know, their pain symptoms or even whether or not they would be fertile. So this was something I added in um, for patients on how to like go about choosing. And I know that I heard Dr. Arrington mention some of these in his presentation. So you want to do your research and your doctor, you want to confirm their education, check medical legal actions. So for doctors, I know this is a doctor's seminar today. So for doctors who are there, especially if you're offering endometriosis surgery, you should also check, you know, make sure that when you're offering these sorts of services that you have the qualifications and the skill set to be able to thoroughly treat someone with endometriosis, fully identify the different ways endometriosis can present. Because I know prior to starting my fellowship, I thought I knew quite a lot about endometriosis and was quite surprised to know that I had learned a few ways to identify endometriosis, but could not identify all the ways uh, endometriosis presents on laparoscopy. So what, you, what your mind don't know, you can't identify. So basically, if you don't know how it looks in all different aspects, you may tell someone that they do not have endometriosis. And oftentimes we have patients come in that had prior laparoscopic surgery, being told that they don't have endometriosis, and then we find an abdomen or pelvis full of endometriosis. So these are just something um, to consider for yourself if you do offer endometriosis surgery, whether or not you have the right training in endometriosis and minimally invasive surgery, and if you perform these procedures often enough to offer the service. So in addition to decreasing inflammation in the pelvis and associated to toxicity to the embryos and gametes, the surgical treatment of endometriosis may result in enhanced uterine receptivity. Uh, patients in their reproductive years with pain and infertility a normal male factor may benefit from surgical management. So in experienced hands, restoration of anatomy without compromising ovarian function results in excellent pain relief and better post-operative pregnancy rates, which we're focusing on. And sometimes it's even better than IVF alone. Um, so we have had these benefits, as I showed you in the previous study, even in patients with previous IVF failure. And by decreasing inflammation in the pelvis and the associated toxicity to the embryos, uterine receptivity can be improved by thoroughly treatment, treating the endometriosis. So that's the study again. And then from that study, I just wanna pull this table. So you saw that the patients who had laparoscopy with 29 and the pregnancy was 22 out of the 29. But this is the patients who did not have laparoscopy in that study was 35. And the pregnancy rate was 13 um, out of 35 who opted for no, um, intervention. The spontaneous pregnancy rate out of the 22 was 13 and in patients who had laparoscopic surgery and the spontaneous pregnancy rate was only two. So as you can see, and these were significant values. So as you can see that patients who underwent laparoscopic surgery by a skilled um, minimally invasive surgery who knew about endometriosis and practiced um, well, and thoroughly removed the endometriosis, as you can see, the pregnancy rate was higher, as well as most of those patients conceived naturally. And these are patients who all had prior failed IVF cycles, okay? So they had multiple failed IVF cycles. There is a difference in discrepancy with age as the non-laparoscopic patients are slightly older, so that is something that can confound, but as adjusted, it was still significant. And um, I'm just recreating a similar study to see with a much larger database, because as you can see, that data set was 29 and 35. So I'm doing it with much more patients um, in the hundreds. And 
looking at the role of laparoscopic surgery versus medication in improving fertility. And we have seen the same thing. And this is a presentation that I would have later this year for the Society of Laparoscopic Surgeons. So you'd hear more about that. So, um, so in conclusion, it should be remembered that the success of treatment when it comes to surgery is dependent on the skill and expertise of the surgery surgeon sorry, in thoroughly treating all disease more than it is on the methods or the instruments used. So that's where like I'm saying, don't focus on whether it's conventional laparoscopic surgery versus robotic surgery, focus on the skill of your surgeon. And we recommend a multidisciplinary management of complicated endometriosis. Um, for starting with medical treatment, proceeding to conservative measures uh, prior to aggressive surgical peritoneal stripping that may carry high risk of complications and adhesion formation. Thank you very much. And I know we're going to move on to questions for everyone now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackman. Um, another wonderful presentation. And um, I only rang the bell once. I could have rung it more than once, but I thought because it was interesting and because we are actually um, um, not too strapped for time that I thought it was important for you to get that. So it just took, you took an extra five minutes, but that's okay, you're home, right? <laughs> so you have, you have home state privileges. Okay, so we have, um, we've completed our, our fine array of, of presenters for this evening starting with our um, helicopter pilot and army veteran and continuing with our um, advocate come lawyer and then our um, local homebred um, uh, skilled surgeon. So we, we are going to have a period of about um, 45 to 50 minutes for questions from the floor. I'm going to ask if you would kindly put your questions in the question and answer box for us so that we can um, answer as many as possible in the time that, that, that we have. But um, I just want to start off by saying I think there were some really good key points of um, difference and key points of similarity in our three experts. Um, and we can talk a little more about that in a minute. But I think, as I mentioned, the, the fact of the ovary getting stuck in the hip because of that um, small distance between the, um, the hip socket uh, mentioned by um, Dr. Dulemba. Um, uh, the, 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 the distinct um, lesson that needs to be learned about using hormonal treatment as a palliation and not as a treatment or worse, not as a cure. And the message from Dr. Jackman that it doesn't matter with all the bells and whistles, the key thing is the skill, the expertise of the surgeon and the number of surgeries that he has performed. So on that basis, let me just have a look and see what we have in the question and answer box because we didn't have anything then. Okay, so the first, the first person at the wicket will be Dr. Arrington. And this question is coming from Indra. And she's asking how to treat with parents who are not willing for the adolescent to undergo surgery? Indra, this is a very interesting question because again, um, we, we have persons who are um, considered underage and we need to wonder whether underage has to relate to pain. So Dr. Arrington, we, we'd be very pleased if you could um, address this question. And there's another one for you afterwards, but let's do with, um, oh no, actually this is this. Ah, question, this is amazing. It's the same question by a different person. Bridget is also asking Dr. Arrington, how do you treat with patients whose parents are not willing for their adolescent to undergo surgery? This is uncanny. Um, either they they know of separate patients, separate parents like this, or or maybe it's the same person and the person has to get the message from hearing this answered. So we'll we'll just let you answer it once because it's the same question. Over to you, Dr. Arrington. So uh, I don't have a perfect answer for this. To tell you the truth, once once you get to my level of endometriosis care, a patient that comes to see me typically is already coming with an expectation that they're going to go for surgery. So it, it's not something that I have seen in my practice. I, I think as a provider, the only, the only thing that I, I can do is to try to educate, to try to help not only the patient understand, but to help the parents understand what the patient is going through and what these options are and what the roles are. 
but I mean also to to make sure that make sure they understand. I think the safety of these procedures, especially in a younger patient, the the risks of laparoscopy. Even though they're they're told over and over and over again that surgery is too risky, that it causes adhesions, that it can destroy your fertility, that that you can perforate the bowel. The truth is in skilled endometriosis surgeons' hands, even in the most advanced cases, these complications are extremely rare. So as much as we can, educate the parent, uh, let them know our personal experience and, and help them, I guess, make it a more informed decision, but also to help them see, help them see the impact that this disease is having on their child's life. Absolutely. Um, I think that was a um, um, very great answer. Um, I see Dr. Lumba has a point, but let me just say um, I, the point taken, the point made, Dr. Arrington, that they, by the time they get to you, it is sort of implicit that they will be coming for surgery because they're coming directly to you. And I was actually going to ask for comments from Dr. Dulemba and Dr. Jackman. So you were right on cue. Please go ahead. Well, my, it, it's actually, I, I agree with Dr. Arrington that it's, you know, you have to address this disease early, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, if a family member is, is, has angst against you know, surgery, which I've actually run into several times, um, I share with them a, a, a patient of mine at 14. I think eight is the youngest I've, I've operated on, but 14, um, there was endometriosis. And, and the good thing is it's, it's not as extensive as they're like you know, 40 but it, and it's harder to visualize in the young teens, but, and that's where the robot comes in, in my opinion. But, it, but the key that I had in this 14 year old is when her, her appendix was abnormal, I took it out. She had carcinoid tumor in her, in her appendix. And, you know, the, the good thing is she had a 20 year old sister who the next month then had surgery with me. So it was beneficial in that aspect because she had enemy choices also, but was just didn't want a surgery. And, and, you know, so when a patient comes in, yes, it's endometriosis, but there was no expectation of carcinoid tumor in our appendix. And I always wonder what would have happened if I had waited, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the road, what would that impact have had on her life at that point? So I, I guess it is kind of, you know, pushing patients, family, but, you know, if the, if the patient wants it and the family, the parents don't, then I think that, we, that I, I try to share that. I don't always share it, but, but again, I think if, if the patient is really adamant, I'm like, I can't live like this to ignore it or to just, you know, they don't have 